The 1930s, Robert Harton created the diagrammatic representation of the hydrological cycle. This was to show the scientists and people alike that hydrology was not only about the underground water flows, but illustrating the main processes involved. A review of the hydrologic cycle by social scientists highlighted two major concerns related to this concept. One, the hydrologic cycle is used globally but it was defined for a specific geographical location. And two, it doesn't include the heterogeneous relationship between water and human beings. This hydrologic cycle concept has been used as a universal concept applied to every environment but was initially based on observations taken from water systems in European temperate climates. Also, in Horton's era, there was a need to quantify and control water as a resource. Therefore, the concept was mathematically structured and in order for it to be accurate and precise, exact data and knowledge were needed. With hydrosocial cycle, you refer to a body of literature of three people who are social scientists and who analyze the, 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 the water cycle from a particular point of view. Exactly. You have also hydrologists who like to include more the, the social dimension and they, they are calling themselves socio-hydrologists. <coughs> but that's a completely different strand of, of science. Mm -hmm. And actually it's very interesting to see that they hardly ever meet. Mm -hmm. We have maybe done in the past as a community is to focus too much on this, um, let's say, scientific um, processes and a little bit ignored the, the, the human impact on it. But I think the hydrological cycle can still be used with some modifications. So you certainly have to add components like uh, population, population increase, water demand, increase of, of water use and uh, um, agricultural features, um, irrigation schemes, etc., to kind of uh, uh, deepen the or extend the hydrological cycle by, by these components. But the Social scientists Linton and natural scientists Savanay, Hoekstra and van der Zijg all agree that anthropogenic activities have greatly influenced the hydrological cycle and they should be included in the assessments. There we have the social scientists, the natural scientists, and something which is a little bit in between, which is called the transition management uh, uh, experts, uh, which is still a little bit difficult, especially uh, in African countries, because transition management as such is not really very well developed as a discipline. But okay, you have this. That's and that's still quite disappointing, actually. Uh, you see that most studies still are, are largely focused, uh, are largely done by, by engineers and scientists, natural scientists. And uh, in many cases, if there is a social component, it's posteriori, a posteriori, it's afterwards. It's uh, bringing in the scientists, social scientists, to try to help bring out your results, rather than having them involved in uh, building uh, the solution to problems that you find. Uh, and, uh, the big challenge is, is to find ways to make these two groups productively engaged wi with each other and that, is, and that is really very difficult because all of us in science we are as it were caught in our own creations because we have we, 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 we have learned to, to, to think in terms of silos, in, in, in conceptually, and it is for us extremely difficult to get out of our cocoons and to, to uh, link up and, and connect with uh, our fellow researchers that are hooked in their cocoons and try to get out of their cocoons. Uh, the climate change and land use change that are uh, directly relevant to also the, this concept of uh, the hydrology society. So not only society, uh, hydrology influencing society, but changes in society also influences hydrology. So that's the part we are talking about. And the climate change and land use change are uh, two uh, 
key factors in there. Uh, it's not that we are only uh, starting those uh, influences, those impacts now. We have been doing it uh, quite a long time, but in recent years, or last uh, a decade or, or a bit more, we are giving, I think, a bit more emphasis on, on those areas. So uh, both in terms of developing uh, future scenarios and uh, trying to see how those scenarios can be modeled uh, with the modeling tool or hydrological model in general, if you like. I'm not sure that they will happen. Of course. Um, to a certain extent, there is an improvement. And let's say there was always, of course, uh, the, the issue of, uh, like in software for groundwater modeling, you always need to include um, wells for abstraction. And the way that that has been included nowadays allows for a high resolution and temporal and spatial resolution. So, uh, of course, computer power has increased, so it also allows uh, more complex phenomena to be modeled. But that's independent from the fact that more human intervention, uh, more human activities occur. If you look at urbanization, decreasing recharge, you can model that. You can model the, the increased impermeabilization of a, of a surface. Uh, in water quality, in chemistry, it's more about the improved sophistication of models that allows you now to do this kind of complex modeling. But that was not per se a, a consequence of wanting to include more human uh, interference or possibilities to, to model human interference in your model. This has more to do with model power and, and the Hydrologists often try to naturalize the flow. Mm. Want to get rid of the human signal to say, okay, this is the, the, the natural flow of the water. Mm. If you want to know the, the natural flow, of course you go to the undisturbed catchment. Yes. And you measure the water there, there you have the natural flow. Mm. However, most of the gauging stations are not in the undisturbed catchments mm. because why do we want to measure water because we want to change the catchment because we want to utilize the water so you have a interesting situation where that in the completely modified catchments you have often many gauging stations mm. and then it's very difficult to understand what was the natural situation because it is modified already mm. and in the Ungaged basins, you find the natural system. Yes. And you don't know ex exactly how the water is flowing mm -hmm. and how the hydrological cycle is, is evolving. So, mm -hmm. so you have an interesting contradiction. Getting to unite people is difficult. Uh, trying to get something growing in the slum, uh, trying to uh, do something about land issues. It may sound uh, strange, but yeah, land issues are uh, are big in slum areas. You cannot do any intervention really because nobody owns the land, or the people that you plan the intervention with they don't own any land. So that is quite difficult. So these are two difficult issues. Uh, yeah, I think uh, finally it will probably be uh, in empowering people, and that is empowering people in the slum. Uh, to sort of to unite or to uh, to to raise their voice uh, in a constructive way, um, such that uh, the regime or let's say the, the the ministries or the municipalities they hear those voices and they listen or at least they start to talk and communicate with uh, slum populations. Is if, you are, if, you have, if, you are, if you are building a confidence uh, uh, bond with a, with, with a water authority in some country, uh, and they are in a project, they are also committed to, uh, to sharing at least some of their data. And that can be not necessarily the raw data that they don't want to share, but uh, treated data in graphs and in tables and so on. Uh, and, and, th and that becomes, that I think is more and more becoming possible, mm -hmm. uh, a certain level of transparency in, in the way that they share data, uh, treated data from, from, the, from their monitoring points. And I think that's the way to go, because you cannot change policy or, or, or laws in countries where, where all these data are confidential. Yeah. But you can work within projects 
with people with, with whom you build this confidence uh, bond uh, and, and, and build with them on a data set that they are allowed and able to share among each other. And of course, then there are conflicts, uh, like in transboundary conflicts of aqu aquifers or catchments, where this becomes an issue, of course. And then again, you, ne you really need social scientists who, who come in and understand the, more com the complexity of, the, of such problems uh, that we as natural scientists may not capture, definitely. In my opinion, the biggest challenge, challenge is the will of the political leaders <laughs> realizes that <laughs> Here we have the good technical knowledge, we have expertise on, in different fields, but usually our, uh, due to lack of um, <coughs> will of our political leaders, most of our project don't um, either start, uh, start execution or, uh, or <coughs> get failed. Uh, it, it varies. It varies a lot. It's wel it's it's uh, welcomed to I think by a minority. I oh, think okay. still it might, uh, I think still looking around, uh, people prefer to work hard in their own domain and produce and and, and uh, even easier, easier yeah. and uh, faster yeah. and and uh, yeah you feel more at, at ease. Mm -hmm. And um, but here within the institute, I think more and more of course we learn uh, to to work like this and we should. Um, no, absolutely not. No, we, we are now experimenting with it, see whether it works. Perhaps we come to the conclusion it doesn't work. Integrating the biophysical and the socio-political aspects of water to create a multidisciplinary approach seems to be the gradual way forward. <laughs>